Okay, recording started. So again, welcome to the virtual open house for music composition for the screen uh, today uh, uh, for Columbia College Chicago. Today is Friday, November 20th, and it's 10 a.m. in Chicago. Uh, I'm one of your presenters. I'm David Martz. I'm the assistant director of graduate admissions. Kubi, do you want to inter introduce yourself again for recording purposes? Yes, uh, I'm Kubala Uner. I'm a professor here at the music department at the college, and I am the director of the music composition for the screen MFA program. And a majority of what we're going to cover in the presentation is all about music composition for the screen specifically, but I did want to take a quick moment to take a step back and talk a little bit about the school as a whole. Uh, for those of you who might not know uh, much about Columbia, so Columbia College Chicago is an arts and media school located in Chicago, Illinois. Columbia's mission is to educate uh, students who will communicate creatively and shape the public's perceptions of issues and events and who will author the culture of their times. And I think that's really reflective in the types of programs that we offer and the curriculum that we have in those programs. About 50% 50, 50 of all of our student population identify as a person of color. So Columbia students really do reflect the economic, racial, cultural, and educational diversity of contemporary America. We're located right in the heart of downtown Chicago in the Cultural Mile. Uh, specifically, we're in a neighborhood called the South Loop, and I'll show that a little bit more in the next slide. We have roughly 7,000 students who attend Columbia, the majority of which are undergraduate students. And then more specifically, the School of Graduate Studies has around 175 to 225 students uh, graduate students in any given year. So our graduate programs are designed for small cohort sizes, so students really receive that personalized uh, attention from our faculty members. And then again, just to again further contextualize where we're at, here's a beautiful picture of famous Buckingham Fountain that you always would see if you're driving up or down Lakeshore Drive. Here behind it is uh, formerly the Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower. And then, hold on, there's two people trying to join the room. Let me let them in. Um, and then if you follow my mouse, right over here is essentially where campus would be. Over here on our campus map, you can see that here. Here's Lake Michigan. There's Buckingham Fountain. Again, here's uh, like Soldier Field, the uh, Field Museum, Shedd Aquarium. And then this uh, colored dot rectangle, it's about two city blocks wide and about a mile north and south are where the majority of Columbia's campuses. So we're all centrally located right in downtown. All these purple dots represent public transportation, so we're easy to ac access via public transportation. All right, that's enough about the school as a whole. Let's talk a little bit more about music comp specifically, and I'm gonna let Kubi take the next few slides. Yeah, so um, um, just a very formal overview of the program. It's a Master of Fine Arts program, which means for those of you interested in that part of it, it's a terminal degree in, in the arts. Um, it's definitely a practice focused program. We're located in the music department. Columbia also has a film school um, and an animation department, et cetera, et cetera. But we're a part of the music department. Um, of course, we work very closely together, both with uh, uh, Cinema and Television Arts, which is the official name of the film school, as well as with Interactive Arts and Media, which is the department where um, game design is housed and animation is housed. So we work very closely together with them, but we're in the music department. The length of the program is two years. I'm very proud of that, and I'm happy to talk about that some more, but I find that is a strength of our program over a lot of other options that you have out there in the marketplace. Uh, Full-time program with a capital F. It's very intense. Um, fall start, so we don't have spring admission, and we're aiming for an incoming class size of around 13 students. Um, obviously, some years we get 12, some years we get 14, because that's the way college, college admissions work. So, um, really cursory overview over the philosophy of the program. The philosophy of the program is 100%, um, everything we do is geared towards helping you get work in the industry the moment you graduate. And when I say work, that means both long-term, the ability to build your career as a creative, as a composer for music, for media, but also, and that is just as important in the shorter term, uh, the ability to find work 
as uh, in entry level positions. And that generally is not, you won't get hired by Steven Spielberg to score his next movie. It will generally be things like assisting other composers, um, doing orchestration work, doing uh, additional music writing and things like that. Um, and in order to facilitate that, everything we do in the program focuses on the hands-on experience of how what we make is made and all the skills needed in order to execute that and also in order to communicate in our work um, and to communicate with people in order to get hired. So the whole networking and um, just general business communication in our field, which is you know, obviously different from say banking. Um, the other thing that is very key to our program, I think we're the only ones who do that and, um, we're certainly the first ones who did that, is we only work on real projects as they actually happened in their full length. So right now we're gonna be visiting Brandon, but he brought the season of A Letter for the King um, to, the, to the class. Now, of course, they don't score every minute of every episode because we only have seven weeks, but they are set up that they could if they needed to, that's the idea. Um, and that has everything to do with the fact that if you just, if I give you a scene, Kublai Uner, you're in my class, I give you a scene from the like Avenger Endgame and I say, okay, score this. That has very little to do with our actual work. Even though, of course, I could give you some decent feedback on what you did and didn't do in the scene, but I wasn't there. Uh, the specificity of the work as it is, you know, as you're working with that particular director on that particular script with these particular producers and the process as it unfolds and also the specificity of a cue as it is in the flow of the entire score. So that one scene doesn't exist by itself. It comes after a number of scenes and leads to a number of more scenes. And those two aspects, you can't really do justice unless you have um, unless you're working on a whole project with somebody who was there when that project first originated. And uh, I'm going to skip ahead to one of the aspects that that then brings with it, and that is the composers in residence. Because if I say I can really only credibly teach the full films that I scored, well, then I need to make sure that you guys get a big variety of the types of projects that you're likely to encounter. And in order to be able to do that, um, we're bringing in the composers in residence. So every year we have three of them come through and they each bring a project. So before Brandon was here, Heather McIntosh was here. Some of you may know her work from Z for Zachariah. Um, I asked her to bring a documentary feature because documentaries are a huge part of um, the possible work that you may be getting. Very different thing to score than you know, an adventure fantasy series like A Letter for the King. Before that, in the spring, that same group was working with uh, three composers who are known as dynamic music partners. And they do a lot of animation, specifically like adventure animation. Many of you know their work from Batman, the Brave and the Bold, and that's precisely what they brought for our, for our composers to work on. So the idea again, really important, the second point on this slide, real world practice with full length projects taught by the original composer. Um, we do a lot of uh, um, recording. We have four recording sessions over the course of the program, starting at the end of the second semester. And these are not student recordings with student um, musicians. Those people make on the side in addition, but these are recordings with professional musicians in professional studios. Um, and the culminating one is of course in our semester in LA, uh, where we have a full orchestra, six hours um, with last year we had 74 piece orchestra for six hours. Um, then actually, over the course of six hours. I can talk about that uh, in detail later. Um, we have a very um, large portion of our graduates go on to work um, directly in the field because that's our main focus. So that has, it, over the last six years that I've been here, that approach really has shown to be successful um, at any given moment in time. I'm in touch literally with every alum that ever graduated from our program since I got here in 2014. 
And uh, at any given moment in time, anywhere from 66 to 75% of them are working in the field. That number may even be a little bit higher if I only look at the people that stay in LA or go to places like New York or um, other centers of media production, um, obviously also in other countries. Um, and then, then two, slot, two highlights that I directly didn't put on the highlight reel, but QB started to tease them both a little bit are both the composer in residency and the semester in LA. So now could we can go a little bit more into de in depth about each of them. Yeah, and so here again, um, the reason why I, I, I jumped ahead is because they're so linked to the idea of the full length projects and real projects taught by the original composer. But here's a list of the composers in residence we had over the last few years. Um, uh, and you can see their credits. Um, you'll notice that, you know, I'm, I'm going very much after working composers. Um, and that has not, not, not necessarily to do with the fact that, quote unquote, the big names are harder to get. The, some of them are actually not harder to get. But, uh, you know, Brandon Campbell, as you will see, because you'll meet him in a few hours, he's barely north of 30. And uh, so his experience of... Um, of how he got started and how he's working is far more relevant to uh, a, a composer in their early to mid 20s than the experience of somebody who got their start in the early 80s. And so while we do have Joel Goodman is basically probably about 60 years old. Um, so we have like a wide variety of people in that regard too in that list. But it's very important to me that we have what I call the composing middle class um, represented here because the way they get work, the kind of work they get, and the way they execute that work is far more relevant for 99% of young composers entering the field. Um, so you can see here um, a list of the people that we had and their credits. I don't have to necessarily read that off. Um, all right. Yeah, you, I think you can move to the next okay. one. And then, yes, semester in L.A. So we have two years in Chicago, and we'll look at that in a second, what those two years look like. But the um, last semester is a five-week semester. It's a summer semester following the second spring semester. So for those of you who enter in the fall of 21, that would be the summer of 23. And we go to L.A. for five weeks, and people get referred to uh, internships. Um, I can talk a little bit more in detail later about how that works, but basically I help people find internships with composers or related professionals, but mostly composers, 90% composers, um, in, in the field that interests them. And that it happens in the afternoons during those five weeks, they go to their internships. In the morning, we have our morning classes called career development. And it's literally just a lecture class where every day somebody else comes in and talks about their work. And it's um, a lot of composers. We had Thomas Newman. We visited James Newton Howard's studio. We visited Harry Gregson Williams' studio. We had Jermaine Franco come in. Um, but then also, again, younger composers, people who just graduated and how they got started. So we always have our alumni round table um, that's called How to Not Die and Indeed Flourish After Graduation. And then uh, all the related professions, agents, lawyers, um, music editors, music supervisors, um, scoring engineers, you name it. Anybody that we interface with on a professional level, we have them come in and talk about that. And so that's the mornings and then the internships in the afternoon. And then of course the big one, you can see the little picture there on the bottom right. That was when we were still at the bridge um, is, the, is the thesis session. Um, and um, it's a six hour session. And this year due to COVID, uh, long story, but we were at Fox, 20th Century Fox for the second year in a row, which is my favorite studio in the entire world. And, um, and because of the COVID regulations, we had to reduce the size of the orchestra. So we said, fuck that. We're going to increase the size of the orchestra by striping. And we'll talk a lot more about striping over the two years, but basically that is multi-tracking an orchestra. So we um, recorded the strings and the harps in the morning, and we recorded the woodwinds and brass in the afternoon, and we ended up with a 74-piece orchestra that way, um, despite the COVID restrictions. And uh, you can hear that on our page. Um, the, it's, it's, it's marked by graduation year. You can hear the, some of the tracks that came out of that session.
And we had Dennis Sands, who literally just mixed Avengers Endgame and 300 other top movies. He was our engineer. So it's pretty phenomenal. So here's the overview over the, the um, two years uh, in Chicago. And I'm going to have poor David jump back and forth between this and the next slide. Hi, my name. Uh, the the first thing is you'll see there's like kind of three spines that go through the three uh, four semesters in Chicago. The number one spine are the scoring classes, and that's really sort of the heart and the soul of the program. That is four hours um, per week, but the class is split in half. So instead of thirteen or fourteen people or twelve, it's six or seven in a four hour class and they're done master class style. So everybody is in the room when everybody gets their feedback from either me or the composer in residence on the, on the queue that we're working on. And of course we do a ton of rewrites because that's the name of the game. Um, so, uh, and that's, that's kind of the, the main um, thread for the two years. Parallel to that, also a thread to the whole two years is the Media Music Tech Lab. And it's just what it says. It's a four hour class every week, 60, um, yeah, 60 weeks. Um, that is all about the technology and it covers everything from uh, digital audio workstations, DAWs, or uh, to details on how to program contact, to basics and how to program WISE, which some of you may not have heard of, which is a middleware, it's kind of a piece of technology that interfaces music with games, to um, yeah, any, any aspect of music technology that you can imagine goes in there. Basic 3D, um, you know, for AR and VR programming and tools, um, and all very hands-on. It's a lab class, meaning it's not just a lecture, but you always get to do it right then and there under the supervision of my, one of my favorite faculty, um, Dan Dehan, um, who is just tech genius. And so the third spine you see at the bottom here is the Screen Music Forum. And that is a two hour class where both years are sitting together in the room. And it's a discussion class. It's kind of the spillover class. Anything that doesn't fit anywhere else goes there. So talking about contracts, talking about networking, overview over repertoire, who is working right now? And that is really important to get a feel of like, who is, again, I like to use that word, the composing middle class, you know, who is um, um, Rob Simonson, who is, um, you know, all the people that you may not have necessarily heard of. Um, Alison Newman, who is, um, so that you kind of have a feel over what's going on in the industry. Um, also the, um, any kind of guest speaker that we have that uh, in during the um, time here in Chicago, more often than not, will show up in Screen Music Forum. So we have, you know, film producers, ad producers, sound designers, um, DPs, um, directors of photography, ed editor, film editors, et cetera, come in that. So those are kind of the two, three spines that go through the whole two years. And then in the first year, you have the survey classes, which you see here, film production survey, music and media survey, and then in the second semester, games, AR and VR production survey. Those are five week classes and they're exactly that. They're like 30,000 foot overviews over how that works. And then the other thing that's in the first two semesters in the first year are the are orchestration classes. Electronic orchestration, which we start with because in the end, all media music is electronic music, even if you have a string quartet do it because it comes out of a speaker. And so you have to treat it um, like music that comes out of a speaker. And then acoustic hybrid orchestration, as you all probably know, most film music, media music, film, television, or game music right now is hybrid, meaning it has electronic elements and acoustic elements. And this, uh, that sequence is taught by Kaz Boyle, who is phenomenal. He is, uh, uh, you can look up his credits. He works a lot with Clint Armstrong. He works a lot with A.R. Rahman. He worked with Trevor Morris on Vikings. And he's still working um, very actively as a compose, as an orchestrator and composer. He actually just had a Netflix movie come out literally this week. And then in the second year, the survey classes and orchestration falls back, uh, falls away. And in, uh, uh, instead you have two semesters of music for games, AR and VR. 
and that's taught by Joel Korolitz, who's a BAFTA nominee and who's working, man, I was going to look up that, uh, he's working on a huge triple A game. You know what? Um, 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 Brian can help me out later when he's on. He'll he'll tell you what he's working on because I'm blanking on the title, but you all have heard of it. And uh, I'm really happy that he's in the program. Um, and then also conducting for media, uh, taught by Alan Tinkham, who those of you in the area know as the music director for the Chicago Youth Symphony and the Chicago Composers Orchestra. Conducting for media is kind of an interesting thing. It's a very important class to me and to our, our composers. And that is because after all this technology and talking about storytelling and talking about, you know, all these things that are quite far away removed from the actual sound. Now you're in a class three hours a week for 30 weeks, waving your hands and singing. And uh, it's all about sight singing, it's about solfege, it's about sight reading, it's about um, conducting, actual physical conducting and, and leading musicians with your body. And um, it, while it's, it's obviously important to be able to conduct at least in a decent fashion, because sometimes you have to, but m far more important outcome of that class is your relationship to your own music changes profoundly. And I'll let the alumni and, uh, and Brian, who's in the middle of it right now, um, talk uh, on that, um, how, how that affected them. Um, so that's the overview over the two years in Chicago. And then we already talked about the semester in LA. I hope I did okay on time. No, that was great. We're still, we're still good. Uh, this is sort of a, I just wanted to quickly point out that, you know, kind of where you would be situated in Chicago. I guess this slide probably would have made more sense if I put that with the campus map earlier, but oh well. Uh, so this, this building right here is just my office and the main administrative office. Uh, but these are more, these other two buildings, uh, 1014 South Michigan and 1104 South Wabash are the buildings where you would most likely be in um, uh, most of your time. Could be anything you want to talk about as far as buildings or facilities? Yeah, that little red box there is uh, my, I love that building. I, um, I can't wait, you know, right now, of course, we're not in there very much, but it's my favorite um, part. It's one of my favorite parts of the school. And uh, it, it, uh, so that's where the music department is. Um, uh, and that's where all of our rooms are, where MFA lab is, where a mix room is, which is accessible even now during COVID. Um, and uh, it's the reason why I like it is because it, it looks like it looks like work. It's looked like it looks like a place where where actual work gets done. I'm always a little leery of uh, of school buildings that are all shiny and marbly because that's not what life as a musician looks like. But this thing, it kind of like if it, if we were a car shop program, it would smell like oil. And so it kind of <laughs> smells like music oil. And it's a great place to do work. It's very inspiring because you constantly hear music around you. And, you know, we don't, I, I haven't said much about our undergrad program and I won't because there isn't that much time, but our undergrad programs are phenomenal. And people work a lot with especially senior undergrad musicians because we have, you know, we have, we have Cassandra O'Neill is on our full time faculty. Look her up. She, 15 years, she played keyboards with Prince. So that's kind of the level of stuff that's happening in the undergrad. And so there are some phenomenal musicians walking around. And as you're walking through the hallway to our MFA lab or to the mix room, you hear people practice and you hear people practice. Another one that's our grad, one of our grads from, I would say four years ago is Jonathan McReynolds. Um, you may know him as a two-time Grammy Award nominee or even winner, I actually forget. Um, in gospel music, um, just phenomenal musicians. So I love that building. I can't wait to be in there like full time again, knock on wood. <laughs> uh, all right, well, a couple more slides left before we get to uh, our alumni and students. Uh, but quickly, I wanted to talk about funding. Obviously a key question when it comes to graduate school. Um, so there are usually four different ways to fund education. Historically, students have used in the past, they've used scholarships, uh, working on campus, working off campus, and then federal loans. Uh, scholarships, Columbia does have a variety of scholarships, both for incoming and continuing students. <clears throat> uh, most of the continuing student scholarships you can't apply to until you are just that, a continuing student. So uh, it wouldn't be something that you could probably start applying to until your second semester. But the incoming student scholarships, those tend to be the most valuable, if you will. Uh, those are merit-based scholarships uh, that by applying to the program on or before the deadline, which we'll talk about on the next slide, um, you are automatically considered for those incoming student scholarships. Those could range anywhere from 25% of your tuition up to 75% of your tuition being covered. 
Uh, and again, they're merit-based, based on the overall merit of your application compared to contrasted against everybody else. Um, again, our scholarship finder is listed there, columnedu slash scholarship. That lists all scholarships, uh, both for undergrad, grad, both for, for writers, for dancers, for musicians. They're all located there on that uh, scholarship page. Uh, working on campus, all graduate students who work on campus can work, whether they're international or domestic, can work a maximum of 20 hours a week. Uh, assistantships are a job that you will work with the music department, uh, uh, and Kubi can talk a little bit more during Q&A about like what are typical assistantship jobs. You're paid with a stipend for that. And assistantships, you have to be essentially um, awarded one at the time of admission. You cannot apply for an assistantship. You have to be sort of given one at the time of admission. So they're treated like incoming student scholarships as well. It's merit-based. Your application to the program also serves as your application to an assistantship. All other campus jobs outside of assistantships, though, you can apply to, I mean, assuming you meet the eligibility requirements, but you can apply to that and would require a separate application later. Uh, working off campus, obviously, some of our students work off campus. Typically, they, those are not international students because only, only uh, international students can only really legally work on campus. There are a couple, you know, weird pay turn, paid internship sort of exceptions to that rule that are a little bit technical, but in general, international students can only work off campus. Uh, but I mentioned, I put this on here because that is what some students do, obviously. We have uh, uh, a student employment um, portal that lists both on-campus and off-campus jobs that are relevant to those particular fields. And then obviously academic departments and our career center will also know, likely know of other internships or other opportunities that are re relevant to your field. Uh, and then lastly, I'm just gonna mention federal loans for domestic students, you know what that is. Uh, and I only mention it because filling out your FAFSA is sort of step one to all that and it should be got done at the same time that you're applying to, to graduate school because it is a separate process and right around the time whether when you're finding out whether or not you're admitted or not, you certainly would want to know what your loan eligibility is at that time as well. Which speaking a little bit about admissions, uh, the application requirements are generally an application fee, a resume, two letters of recommendations, transcripts from every university or college you've attended, uh, an essay, a portfolio, and then international applicants might have additional requirements such as proof of English proficiency uh, or a transcript evaluation. And all application requirements can be found down there at that website, column.edu slash grad admissions. And QB, we can go into more detail during Q&A, but is there anything quickly you want them to take away as far as the essay in the portfolio. I know they all have a lot of questions about portfolio because I've been handling them all. <laughs> yeah, um, we obviously a lot of it is written sort of the formal um, elements of the portfolio are listed on the website. The one thing I really want to uh, stress is the importance of the essay. Um, and you know, like, do not avoid sort of what the typical high school counselor essay bullshit. We really want to know who you are as an artist, why you want to go into the field of music for media, and what you're, you know, what 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 pulls you into it. And um, it's yeah, I, 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 we you know, we love people who want to come to us, um, but you, there's no need to sell yourself. It's more about tell about yourself. Mm -hmm. That's really the most important thing. Good, good call. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about the timeline. So you can begin or continue your application at column or at apply.colum.edu slash apply. The final deadline oh, is January 15th. Uh, and then decisions are typically reached six to eight weeks after that deadline, um, uh, which would be about the beginning of March through the middle of March. Uh, but January 15th is your drop dead deadline. And that's it. Uh, there's Kubi and Mai's email address. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. Uh, if you have questions for Brian, whom I'm about to introduce, you can email me and I can forward those on to Brian. So with that, let me stop the recording and let's